So I thought I'd make a video about capitalism, uh, talk about the sort of dynamics of capital accumulation. Um, I want to talk first about uh, what is capitalism. Now, there are a lot of, particularly libertarians, other who uh, will define capitalism as liberty or as a free market or uh, you know, lack of government intervention uh, in, the, in the economy. So they're talking about capitalism in, in a negative sense. It's the lack of government means very capitalism, which the implication is that capitalism is the natural uh, form of the economy which exists without state intervention, which is bullshit. Um, I want to, capitalism is not about the size of government. It's not about the level of government intervention. In fact, uh, there are several forms of capitalism Ranging from the the laissez-faire form to uh, you know more complex, you know, New Deal capitalism, welfare capitalism, uh, even you know very strong state capitalism like we have in Singapore. Um, what capitalism fundamentally is uh, is a mode of production. It involves class relations, where there is one class that owns the means of production, um, and another class which is dispossessed, which has to which has nothing but their labor power to sell to the capitalists. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about uh, what is capital. Now we can talk about capital goods such as a factory or tools, uh, means of transportation and stuff, based, based on the means of production. Um, but note that these things are only capital not in themselves but by uh, the purposes towards which they're employed. So um, they're simply part of the capital process. Capital fundamentally is a process. It is the employment of money in the pursuit of more money. Uh, it is the continual pursuit of surplus value. Uh, now, uh, what is sur now, what is surplus value? Um, there's two kinds. There's rent and interest, and those are mixed together to a large extent and dynamically dependent upon, on one another. Uh, rent, I've talked extensively about in a lot of my videos. Um, it's the uh, surplus. It's the social surplus produced by uh, society, uh, which is privatized through primarily land values, but uh, there are other forms of rent as well. Um, and what is unique about rent is you don't have to actually uh, do anything to to earn it except own something. You don't have to actually employ labor. You don't have to. Um, you know, engage in any production at all, but production has to exist in order to, for the rent for rent to exist. Because if nobody's producing and everyone's just holding on to the land, then you're not going to get anything out of it. Um, so, rent uh, provides a counter incentive against too much production, but um, but you have to have some production in order for it to exist at all. Um, now, interest is basically the surplus value of, it's basically the rate of profit you can extract from uh, labor through the means of production. Um, and the that rate of profit will depend upon the power of labor. So, uh, where, so where labor can easily uh, go somewhere else and, uh, and get a better deal, then your bargaining position is going to be weak and you'll have to pay them more in order to get them to stay. Whereas uh, if work is scarce, if access to capital is scarce for the workers, then uh, they won't have much choice but to work for you for whatever wage you offer. So, um, that is, and uh, you know, rent plays a role in that in terms of limiting capital so that it is held in, a few, in fewer, fewer hands. Uh, and allows for this surplus value to exist. Uh, so, you know, capital has to accumulate. It has to, um, capitalists have to continue to accumulate surplus value and then reinvest it. Uh, and the reason is that if they don't, then they'll be driven out by competition. Um, you know, if, if you accumulate the surplus value and just sort of sit on it, then someone else is going to I'll compete you and drive you out of market and you'll uh, cease to be a capitalist. And even if you have a monopoly, you still need to continue to accumulate in order to maintain your monopoly position and you use your money to you know, buy um, you know, special favors from the state and whatnot. And I think I should say a little bit about the role of the state. Now, I've there's a common thing where people say that 
um, you know, and I've been guilty of this too, where I say that uh, the, the, the state exists simply to serve the interests of, of the capitalist. Uh, this isn't quite accurate. Um, the state and the capitalist have a kind of dynamic um, relationship, which where their interests overlap but are not quite identical, and there's sometimes a tension between the two. See, for a politician, for, for the state, their interest is in attracting capital to their uh, the domain they rule over. So, uh, you know, that if you're if you're the mayor of some town or the governor of some state, you want to attract investment into your state so that there will be jobs and income and all this tax revenue you can you can get from them. Um, so, but if you're a capitalist, it doesn't really matter to you where you invest your capital. Like, you know, you'll just look for the best deal wherever you can. Uh, and so it's precisely because of your ability to get up and leave that the state is sort of beholden to you. Um, and so the sort of bribery and corruption goes both ways. You know, both capitalists will uh, you know, buy up politicians through campaign donations and, or, or send out cor era corruption. Um, but also the states have to bribe the capitalists to, to come there and stay and invest in uh, their particular district. Um, and they'll, they'll try to manipulate laws, this thing to um, make that to make their place a more uh, investor-friendly area. Um, but anyway, there's a contradiction involved in this uh, constant drive towards capital accumulation, which is that uh, the capitalists have to keep reinvesting their surplus value into more and more areas. Um, but that reinvesting requires that there be a demand for uh, for the products they produce. There has to be aggregate demand. And uh, for the aggregate de demand to exist, people have to have income, which is a uh, countervailing force against the surplus value to begin with. So you need to have surplus value uh, in order to keep, and you have to keep reinvesting it, but you have to have a market in which you can sell the products. And uh, there are several strategies that capitalists use to circumvent this. Uh, one of them is uh, financial innovation, like we saw with the derivatives market. Um, you know, financial in innovation is very central to capitalism, and uh, capitalism, the history of capitalism can often be characterized as a hi history of uh, financial innovation. You know, there's creation of fictitious markets. Through, uh, the, uh, the derivatives are one part of it. You know, there's patents, there's carbon trading. Um, another thing that was very prominent over this last boom before the bus was credit. Um, it had all this, uh, you had uh, people uh, using their house as collateral. There was all these credit cards being issued so that people would go into debt. I mean, it was, so, you know, not only the capitalists have a market for the products, but they could also then uh, get the interest from the people who had the, all this debt. So it was a double win for them until, of course, the whole system crashed. Um, another uh, another strategy is to sell capital goods to other capitalists, because of course you know there's capital goods and there's, cons there's consumer goods. But of course somewhere down the chain you have to still have consumer goods. You know, capitalists can't just sell to them, can't just sell to each other. There has to be someone down the line who's going to actually buy something they're going to use and not reinvest. Um, and uh, one final thing is uh, move to new markets where uh, where there where there is aggregate demand, and uh, I. For those who think that we're actually going to get out of this crisis anytime soon, I got news for you. Um, heads of corporations, boards of directors, capitalists of all kinds are uh, looking for places to reinvest their capital and uh, to look and uh, for where there is a consumer market to look to. And um, they're not looking at the United States; they're looking at China. China, of course, is where they've already exported all their production, uh, and now there's actually sufficient middle class there that's they uh, there's now a market where they can sell consumer goods and they will you know they'll go to that cash cow for and drain it for all it's worth before moving on to somewhere else uh, so but all these ways of circumvention are unstable the all all those can only be cut out for so long before they collapse and capitalism never solves uh, the crisis it just it just moves it around uh, so Basically, I mean, there there eventually comes a point where 
capitalism itself has to collapse, but it can collapse regionally and uh, before people you know, have enough. And uh, so that's why right now we really should be looking for alternatives. And uh, you know, if, if workers would just take the means of production for themselves, then they could uh, produce for the satisfaction of needs instead of uh, earning profit for someone else. And that means they can work less and consume less and have more leisure time uh, and, you know, for more social interaction. So, um, that's why I, th I think you know, capitalism really has hit, it hit the fan. And, and if this isn't the final collapse of capitalism that we're living through, uh, it might it might be the penultimate one. Uh, we're, we're very close to uh, to a point where capitalism just cannot, you know, I mean, we, we can't go back to the rate of growth that we've had all this time. Uh, you know, even if it doesn't reach economic limits, it might re reach ecological limits soon. So, um, yeah, it, it's time to start looking for alternatives uh, because uh, we don't really have much choice at this point. So, peace.